Good evening, it's lovely to be here. And I'm going to speak to you about the gains and perils of individualism. Now, individualism and the rights and freedoms that arise from it have been prominent in Western society for probably the last two to three hundred years, and especially in the USA. Ralph Waldo Emerson, a poet and a writer, said, to be yourself in a world that is constantly trying to make you something else is the greatest accomplishment. This was in the early 1800s. Another American writer, Ayn Rand, said even more strongly, individual rights are the means of subordinating society to moral law. And Frank Sinatra, the entertainer and singer from the 50s, 60s and 70s famously sang, and I'm not going to sing it for you, but it was along the lines of, I did it my way. Now, I'm neither an American nor a poet or a writer. I'm not even an ethicist or a philosopher. But what I want to do tonight is to share some of my observations, having worked as a doctor in South Africa for 34 years in the public sector there, working in areas of need with people across different cultures about what I saw of the gains and started to see of some of the perils of individualism. Now, there's no doubt that individualism has re resulted in great gains. So I'm going to talk to you about some of the many gains that I can see. In the practice of modern law, if a person is charged with a crime, they have the right get it to work, to be presumed innocent until proven guilty. This is a very powerful basic principle to protect people from coercion from powerful institutions or on the other hand from mob justice. I saw both of those in South Africa in the civil unrest in the, in the 1980s and the 1990s with apartheid police having the power to arrest anybody they choose and hold them in indefinite detention without charge. And on the other hand, mobs being able to catch people in the street, accuse them of being traitors or thieves, and set them alight. What about the freedom of movement? Maybe you haven't thought about this, but we're free to move. I was free to move to South Africa in the 80s. I was free to come back here. We're free to move to where we want to live. This is a powerful freedom. Yes, it's bound by things like national borders, how much money you have, how educated you are, but still, there's a basic freedom of movement. And this protects people from the slavery that you see. If you look at the whole feudal system in Europe for many centuries, people were not allowed to move. We know about freedom of speech. Freedom of speech is a really important thing that enables individuals to be able to speak their opinions without fear of persecution by powerful institutions. Those institutions could be governments, they could be religious bodies, they could even be inst educational institutions. What about freedom of choice? At a university, we illustrate one really important freedom of choice. We, in our society, we're quite proud of being able to say to our children, you can be anything you want to be. You want to be a pilot? You want to be a ballet dancer? Go for it. A very powerful freedom of choice. But as well as having freedom of choice, we have the freedom to refuse. It's called individual consent. Again, a very powerful freedom for people to be able to say yes or no when faced with choices. Are you being told about a new fancy medical treatment? You can refuse it. Are you being offered an operation? You can choose it or not. Are you being asked to be involved in a research experiment? You can say, no thank you. These are just some of the important freedoms. There are many, and I'm sure you can think of lots. In fact, there are so many that we kind of assume them. And in fact, sometimes we're not even aware of them. So what I want to do is to tell you a story of how I learned to see through a different set of lenses. This story comes from some years ago when I was working in an eye department at a regional hospital in South Africa. 
I was asked to see a young black woman who'd been badly injured in a minibus accident some hundred kilometers away. She had a severe head injury, she had a broken leg, she had an injured eyelid which I had to repair. On day two in the ward when I did the rounds, um, I saw her, she'd woken up, and she said to me in English, which was her third language, what's happened to my baby? She was in the minibus with me. We didn't know. I phoned the doctor in the small town, and he told me that the baby had been killed in the accident. That was really distressing. And I said to the black professional nurse in the charge of the ward, please help me. We need to tell this woman that her baby was killed in the accident. I cannot tell her in English. That's not fair. We must tell her in Iskosa, her language. Now, the sister in charge said to me, in fact, she refused. And all of the black professional nurses in the ward refused to tell her but instead they explain to me that in their culture you cannot tell somebody about the loss of a loved one unless they are with their family to give them the support they need. Instead, what they told her was, your baby is looked after. You need to go and speak to your family. Now to me, using my individualist lens, that looked terrible. How could you not tell her something like this when she has a right to know? But I started to see it through the, in, through the lens of the nurses who saw it in a collectivist fashion. And when they looked at what I wanted to do, they thought it was horribly cruel to think of telling her such devastating news without the support of her family. You see, I started to see that the nurses had more of a collectivist, community-minded view than I did. So you see, individualism is a particular set of lens. It has great gains, but I began to see some of the perils. What about freedom of speech? When does it become hate speech? And in an individualist, pluralist society, who's going to say what's hate speech and what isn't? But what about the harm when freedom of speech is used to harm and vilify people? How do we solve that one? What about freedom of choice? It's used, it's cited as a justification for adults to be able to view pornography. They're adults. They've got freedom to choose. They've consented. But what about the harm to people involved in the industry? Or people coerced into the industry? Or people trafficked into the industry? What about the harm to countless younger and older people whose lives are warped by pornography? Is individualism the only lens that we should use here? What about freedom of choice to choose your career? There are harms here, there are perils here that are not so easy to see, but nonetheless real. In the medical field, it takes many years to before you're fully qualified. Medical students are often asked, oh, what are you going to specialise in? But you see, to specialise takes many years after university of getting into an accredited training programme and finishing your training. So students and junior medical officers plan their careers. They look around for the best hospital unit to work in. They do their research project and try and get it published, all to get an edge in the competition for limited training posts. They work hard, but they don't get into the posts. And after a while, they realise that they're never going to get to where they wanted to. And for many, this is their whole identity for the last six years. What then? You see, their freedom of choice has become a shackle that blinds them to the fact that there are many fields of medicine out there. There's many areas of need where they can actually contribute to their society, but they can't see it. They've been chasing their dream.
I want to talk a little bit more in detail about the perils of individualism by looking at the case of voluntary assisted dying. Now, for many years, doctors have seen it as their moral duty to relieve pain and suffering, but they've also taken oaths that they won't kill patients. Now, voluntary assisted dying or physician assisted suicide basically is a situation where a patient requests a doctor to assist them to die, usually in cases where they feel that their life is unbearable and the suffering they're undergoing is unbearable. And with the system of voluntary assisted dying, a doctor will then either prescribe, supply, or administer, or a bit of all three, a medication, a fatal, med fatal dose of a medication to assist the person to die. Now this has been legalised in a number of countries, Belgium, Netherlands, New Zealand, Canada, and now in all six states in Australia. Now if we take an individualist lens and look at it, voluntary assisted dying allows an individual the right to decide that their life is no longer worth living, to request the assistance of a doctor so that they can die with dignity in a place at a time and with the people they choose. Now, from an individualist point of view, this is a very compelling argument. But let's put some collectivist lenses on. Legalising voluntary assisted dying is a potential risk to people in the society that are vulnerable. People like the frail elderly. People who are mentally and physically disabled and require long-term care. So all of the countries that have actually legalised voluntary assisted dying have put in conditions to try and mitigate this risk to vulnerable people. So I've just put up a summary here of the conditions that are in the Victorian statute about access to voluntary assisted dying. That it must be a terminal disease. <coughs> that the patient is experiencing unbearable suffering that death is expected in the next six to 12 months, that there are three separate requests made by the patient to two different doctors, and that the patient must be assessed as having capacity to decide. So these are the types of conditions that have been put in across various countries to try and protect the vulnerable. And in theory, they should. But in practice, we all know that legal provisions are often difficult to access for the poor, the elderly, and the physically disabled in our society. So you see an attempt to provide a good thing for the individual can become a means by which we harm vulnerable people who are less able to navigate the system. So how do we solve this? dilemma between individualism and protecting people in society, individualism and collectivism. I'm not suggesting that we should become a collectivist society that comes with its own different set of problems. But what I want to try and do is suggest a way of thinking about it that will help us through this dilemma. And I want to look at the so-called four pillars of med medical ethics. Of course, I'm using medical examples. I come from the medical field. This is the modern formulation of medical ethics. It's called the four pillars, and there are, funnily enough, four pillars. The first one is respect for patient autonomy. Second one is justice. The third one is beneficence. And the fourth one is non-maleficence. Now, these have been around for a while. They were first proposed in the 1970s and then widely accepted from the 1990s. And they've been found to be acceptable across many cultures and been useful to help doctors to decide what is ethical and what is right. But there's a problem, because when we look at these pillars, we tend to think that these four pillars are foundational or primary, primary principles. But actually, they are based on a much more long-standing ancient set of moral, one particular moral duty I want to show you what I think is this basic moral duty. The longest 
continuous living culture in the world. The, the culture of the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people of Australia understands this moral duty very well. They, have relation, they understand and respect relationships with their family, with their elders, with their community, and even with the land, and they understand their responsibility to look after each other. We see this in other ancient cultures. In ancient Chinese culture, Confucius said, never do to others what you would not let them do to you. Even in ancient Rome, men were brought into existence for the sake of men, that they might do one another good. You can tell it was a very male-dominated society. Love your neighbour as yourself from the Judeo-Christian tradition. And even from Islam as well, one of the, st the statements from the Quran, none of you will have faith until he loves for his brother or his neighbour what he loves for himself. So how do we sum up this basic moral duty? Well, we should look after each other. You see, if we should look after each other, you can solve those four pillars. If we need to look after each other, we will respect individual rights. If we look after each other, we will seek for justice and fairness for everybody. If we look after each other, we will do good to each other and not harm. You see, if you see that that principle is our basic moral duty, if you see we should look after each other, we can derive the principle of individual human rights. But you cannot flip it the other way. If you start with individualism, you cannot get to, we should look after each other. In fact, if you take it to its logical conclusion, you will finish up with in sovereign individuals. So if we have a dilemma between individualism and our duty to look after each other, it's clear that our duty to look after each other is our primary moral duty. The United Nations put together a Declaration of Human Rights in 1948. And you can see this same moral duty in article number one. All human beings are born free and equal in dignity and rights. They are endowed with reason and conscience and should act towards one another in a spirit of brotherhood. If we take this duty to look after each other, we will be able to respect each other as individuals and we'll be able to live as individuals, but not just individuals alone. We'll live as individuals in community. Thank you very much.